Desk Lady Ada. Hey everybody, and welcome to a Sunday night, Desk Lady Ada. We uh, had a fun, exciting weekend hanging out with a lot of friends, but now it's hanging out with our yeah. internet friends, you guys. Everybody's our friend, and Picture. we're looking forward to seeing more people in person. So, um, because, you know, things are getting more chill, and uh, everyone's vaccinated and doing all the right things, we were able to catch up with some folks, folks who ran Maker Faire in the past, and then... Folks who have uh, done a lot of things in computer security over the decades. It's true. So uh, it was a lot of fun to see people that uh, we know, uh, people we haven't seen in a long time. And uh, we're really happy to wrap up the weekend with Desk of Lady Ada. Lady yeah. Ada, what did you do that's on your desk this week? God, I don't remember what I did this week. But I, I did a couple things. Um, actually, you know, so a couple weeks ago, I, I churned out a whole bunch of hardware. So this week was a lot of working on testers and getting stuff manufactured and ready for release. So one thing that's in the store right now you want to sign up for um, for when we release it is the Feather ESP32 V2, which just came out. Yeah. You want to maybe pop to the overhead real fast? No. Yeah. While, while you do your thing, I'll do my thing. This is, this is the only thing I'm doing. Okay. Why don't you have to, like, ch check the chat and, like, you know, make sure everyone's happy. No, I just press one button. It's all automatic now. Oh, really? No. no. <laughs> No. Um, so this is the Feather ESP32 V2. So I think I, I've shown it this a couple times, I think, on the show. Um, this is actually really, like, Rev A was, like, ding dong, done. So this is one of the rarities. It, it says Rev F, but it's actually, it's Rev F of the ESP32 uh, board, but it's the first, the first version I did of this was pretty much perfect, except for I just needed one pull-up resistor on um, the button. But it uses the ESP32 Pico um, because I downloaded... Um, from DigiKey, I got the package for it. I didn't have to do the package layout, so the pinout was all corrupted and everything. Um, so this is an ESP32 dual core. It's you know it's an older chip at this point because I've been using the ESP32 S2 and S3, but there's still a lot of projects that use the classic ESP32. Um, and because it's so much smaller than you know the large ESP32 module, actually this has a classic size ESP32 module on it. So you see how much smaller it is. Um, this took up like, you know, almost all of the board and, you know, I didn't, it like went up to here. And so I only had space for like the button and um, the reset button, power supply and the USB serial converter. Um, but what happened is that the ESP30, sorry, the CP2104, I think we mentioned this, the CP2104, which is a USB serial converter chip I use for like everything. Um, it wasn't end of line, but it was kind of like we're, you know, it was nearing the, the, its end of life. And uh, normally you can get chips for a couple of years, but because of silicon shortage, um, Scilabs really quickly moved to like, hey, this CP2104 has, is no longer going to be available. We're moving to the CP2102N. And it is very similar, but it's not quite the same. And you need a resistor divider on um, the, uh, the VBUS detect pin. Probably because there used to be an old issue with CP2104s where um, I'd see them pop sometimes. And maybe they, that's why. So um, I guess, you know, they fixed that issue. Um, the CP2102 is a really nice upgrade. But since you need a new resistor divider, it's one of those things where it's like, if you're going to fix one thing on the board, you might as well fix everything on the board because you're going to have to do a board respin and you're going to reprogram it. Da -da -da, like all this stuff. And like, it was, it was like, look, if I'm going to go through and fix that, then I was like, well, I should fix some low power stuff. And then it was like, well, you know, maybe I should update to this Pico module, which is smaller and has PS RAM, because I've always wanted to have an ESP Feather with PS RAM. And then it was like, well, you know, I should add a NeoPixel. And then I had to, you know, I was like, well, I could add a stomach UT port. And I was like, well, maybe I should add like another regulator so you can go into ultra low power mode. And then basically, like, the whole thing got redone. And then, like, you know, USB C. Um, so the whole thing got uh, refreshed, but it's pretty much the same price. Um, about 20 bucks, but now it's got, you know, a lot more going on with it. Um, I think people are going to like it. Um, you know, one thing that's, uh, was fun. I had a little space out of another button, uh, so you can reset and a user button. Um, but I forgot the ESP32 has input only pins and not only input only, but there's no pull ups. So yeah, I needed to have an external pull up resistor on there. So you see there's a little, um, resistor pack down here. And one of those resistors is the, the pull up. Um, but I even did a check with the PPK um, to check the power draw. I love my PPK. It's like I'm using it every day now. And I got that to 70 microamps. So that's like pretty good considering, I, you know, I'm not going with a special regulator or buck supply that's ultra, ultra low power. Um, so I think it's going to be a really nice little upgrade. So this is, this is coming out shortly. 
You can see I don't go, didn't go with Enig, uh, no gold on the pads because uh, it was Chinese New Year and I didn't want to delay my boards. And they're like, if you know, if you don't do Enig, we can actually get your board out a little faster. So I just went with um, Lead Free Hassle. So fun. So this was the original. This was the first board, and you can see very few things changed. I just added that resistor pack down here. I replaced two resistors with a resistor pack to add the uh, um, pull down, or sorry, the pull up. Uh, but that's pretty much it. The rest of the board actually came together. So it's it's always kind of happy new year, right? Happy Lunar New Year when you get your board right the first time. Uh, so do sign up for it. It's going to be in the store this week. We're just uh, prepping and testing the design right now. Um, next up, fun project uh, Foamy Guy did is a little Winamp player. So let me yeah. reload this. I'll say one thing that was, you know, um, it definitely works, but it made me think like I really want to redesign the Pi Portal. I can see if it's a Winamp. So this is a, it's a very simplified interface um, because we don't have like an equalizer in CircuitPython. Like, well, you can. Actually, we I can, should, but we haven't done it I yet. Should, I should mention one thing. So we could like work on this forever and do a perfect clone of Winamp yeah. that's fully implemented in Python, CircuitPython. But we wanted to have something out there for people to start doing stuff with and playing with. So you can do, like, it looks like a Winamp player. It I mean, it does this, the timing's correct, yeah. and the scroll is correct. I think we could probably, like, yeah, I but mean, like, everything can be There's purists out there that are like, this isn't identical. It's like, yeah, not yet. So yeah. this is a start. Yeah. Like, I think all, we can like get all good things, they start somewhere. I think, I think yeah, I have, I have some ideas also about... Um, yeah. So you're saying do. you want to redesign the Pi Portal? I do want to redesign the Pi Portal because, you know, it's got the um, M4 plus the ESP32. And, you know, now that the ESP32 S3 is out, I really want to um, revise this to not have two chips on it so it's less expensive. Because the Pi Portal, the reason it's expensive is, is like there's two chips and they're both not inexpensive. Like each chip is like three or four bucks. And then the TFT is like, you know, 12 bucks. And then before you know it, your bill of material is $20. And now your product is 50 bucks, right? So I want to, um, I think you're going to redesign it with just one ESP32 S3 and put maybe the TFT on the high speed SPI. Because um, that's another thing is like the reason this is uses a lot of pins and not a lot of pins available is that this um, has a parallel port interface, 8 bit parallel port interface, because the SPI on the um, SAM D51 doesn't go above, it goes to 24 megahertz, but it, it maxes out there and 24 megahertz isn't very fast. So to make this really fast and allow like really quick updates um, to do like animated GIFs and stuff, we went with the 8-bit parallel interface. But like, you know, now if, like, if you have an ESP32 S3 and I can use the high-speed SPI, um, it, you know, you can run it at 80 megahertz and the TFT is not, it's not rated for 80 megahertz, but you can run it at 80 megahertz and that'll save a lot of pins and then you can have more stuff on it. And like, I could, you know, I, there's a couple, the Pi Portal was like a very new design for me and I, I, I made a lot of mistakes with it, to be honest. Um, it's still totally usable, but like going back to it now, like four years later, I'm like, oh, you know, I didn't do the analog power supply right. And like, I didn't do the level shifting on the. Um, and there's a request for the, the, Stemma QT. Yeah, like Stemma QT yeah. didn't exist yet, so I had the yeah. old Stemma. All right, well, so it sounds like, like we have a blueprint for the uh, the next one we're going to Yeah, do. I want to do a couple things, and, you know, I think I'd have an I2S amp maybe, but, like, the idea overall is good. I mean, there was nothing like this at the time, the, the whole idea of, like, oh, it's CircuitPython, yeah. Internet connected TFT screen, like believe me, like now you're like this seems very boring, but at the time there was nothing like it that was as easy to use. So um, I do like to, you know, just like the Feather ESP32 got revised, and I think this is a really nice revision. Um, I learn stuff as an engineer. I'm learning stuff. I'm building. There's no better way to learn than to to build stuff, release it, get feedback, and then I think maybe I'll redesign it. You know, again, make it. Um, make it less expensive. With the ESP32 S3, I can do it. Like, when this came out, yeah. there was no, you know, like, it didn't exist. <laughs> you know, like, wow. there was no um, low-cost Wi-Fi-enabled microcontroller that was high power. Um, there is now, and so I think that could be kind of fun. So check out this um, demo. Uh, you know, you can forward track, which I think is cool. And it's like, it's got a little retro nostalgia going on here. 
and I like the scrolling text here. And then um, you can take um, PNG images of other skins. I'm using the classic skin here, which of course whips the llama's ass. But yeah, you can get uh, other skins. Like I think I had a Sakura skin or something, or some like anime skin when I was a teenager. But um, this is very uh, nostalgic for me. So that's that's another project, um, a fun little project to build. And then maybe people could. It's actually a really good demo of how to make a kind of an advanced user interface with scrolling text and this scrolls, so um, cool stuff. All right, any other questions on the things? Well, let's uh, keep going. Okay. Um, how are we doing on time? Great. Uh, so the next thing I did is we got some samples of LCDs, and I got like one big-ass LCD and a bunch of these little duels, and I got one um, triple-digit LCD, which you can kind of see here. And um, I was like, oh, I want to get this running. And, you know, I know that you can activate LCD segments with just a uh, 5 volt power supply because I've done it before. When uh, And we have um, the LCD shutter glasses in the shop, and those you just, um, you just power them with 5 volts, and they turn on and off. And I was like, oh, so it must be really easy to just um, connect this LCD to, like, an Arduino. I'll find an Arduino library. I'll just get it running. And it's actually totally not there. Like, nobody... I could not actually find any evidence that anyone has done this before, which is um, just connect an LCD to GPIO pins. This is a um, Cutie Pie SAMD21. And uh, I just have all the pins in a row, and then there's one pin that would have been a power pin, so I kind of like connected up to here to A0. But I just kind of folded the pins over into the GPIO pads um, and multiplex them. It turns out that this is like not really done. Um, and I see why. I mean, there's a little bit of ghosting, and you can even see it, like, here especially. You see this digit is kind of flickering. It's quite hard to power and depower the the pads correctly. Um, I, you know, you also have to have a timer. Like, you use a lot of power because you are... Uh, you have to, like, toggle these GPIO pins really fast to keep this display refreshed every couple milliseconds. Um, it's, it's a low power operation that doesn't use a lot of current, but it uses like, you, you have to have something, you have to have something with a clock that's like kind of refreshing the pad. So, you know, if you're using LCD, usually you're doing something low power, you wouldn't want to do this. There are microcontrollers that have an LCD driver, and I think the LCD driver can like run in an ultra deep sleep mode. Um, and, you know, I think the, the CircuitPython Watchy project um, is a, um, an example of using, like, I think the Sam L 21 C there's, there's chips that have a built in LCD controller that'll do the toggling for you. Cause it's, you know, it's something that you'll want to have on while the rest of the chip is in deep sleep and you can do it with like shift registers and, and a square wave. Um, but, uh, but this is just doing it with GPIO pins, but it does work. Um, one thing that's interesting about LCDs is they are not like LED, um, you know, seven segments. LED seven segments, you know, you turn on the LED, you, know, you, start, you set the common low, you set the segments that you want, you wait like 10 milliseconds, and then you turn off the common, you go to the next common, and you turn on the segments. For one, it isn't split up the same way as LEDs where you have seven segments and then a common for, you know, one anode for each segment, uh, sorry, for each digit. The, the commons and the segments are like, on LCDs are like, they're kind of mixed. And I think that's partially because of the way they pattern the glass um, to make it inexpensive to pattern the ITO glass for the LCD elements. There's this, it's not, it's not like one digit per pin. It's, it's kind of this weird intermixed multiplex system. And second, you know, you don't just turn on the LED and then turn it off. You actually have to like, invert the common pin back and forth and uninvert with the ones that are off. Well, you have to kind of do a little bit of like a flippy flippy because it's expecting an AC waveform, not a DC waveform. So it's not like set the pin, set the common low, set the segment high. It's okay, set the segment high, common low, and then flip them and then flip them back and forth constantly. And then if the segment's off, you don't flip them, you, you keep them the same. So I thought that was kind of interesting. I've never worked with low level LCDs because um, it's always been like, you know, a seven segment display where it's like all ready to go and it's, you know, a dot matrix something, um, 
all, all, all finished in, 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 in a module. Um, but these are very low cost and, you know, you can get them custom made. And so I thought that was, um, and, you know, you see them in products a lot. So I was like, well, what's, what's up with this? So I learned a lot about this. So if you're, you know, if you're ever interested in LCDs, you can pick one up and you can drive it from GPIO pins just by flipping it. And there's a um, good app note from Microchip, the AVR 241, um, which is like literally called like how to drive an LCD seven segment using GPIO pins. And um, they do tell you how to do it. It doesn't look great. Again, there's a little bit of ghosting. But it's fine for, like, you just want to get going and maybe test out your design before you, you, you know, go deeply into a um, uh, electronic layout with the LCD driver and LCD chip. All okay. Right. So any questions about that? No. Mm-hmm. Let's, uh, you want to do the great search? Yeah, so let's go to the great search. All right, the great search. Where All right, every single week, Lady Ada uses her powers of engineering to help you find what you need to find online. One of the best places, digikey.com. Lady Ada, what is the great search this week? Okay, this week's great search is on the topic of LCD drivers. I've uh, never searched for an LCD driver before, and uh, I was curious. So can we go to the overhead, and I'll just quickly show this off again. So we've got these this little seven-segment LCD. I'm driving with GPIO pins, and here's some bigger LCDs. And a lot of people, when they make a product... Uh, you will go with um, an LCD display. It's a very common, very low cost, very low power uh, user interface device. Uh, it's daylight readable. Uh, you can add a backlight. Now it's readable at night. Um, but again, very inexpensive, very low cost. You can get custom segments. Uh, it's a very, very popular way to add a user interface. Like, you know, multimeters have them, calculators have them, um, stuff around your house is going to have an LCD. So, um, chances are you're going to integrate one into your product design if you're an electrical engineer. So let's look at how to uh, find a driver for these uh, bare LCD modules where you just get the commons and the segments brought out. So let's go to the computer. And this was fun because I had to do this today because uh, I was curious. So we'll, we'll learn what I learned. So the first thing was like I had no idea what this was called. So I just tried LCD driver. Sometimes the part of the trick is knowing what to what to find. Um, so it turns out that was actually a pretty good guess because there's display drivers, there's display monitors, but this I think um, these are like for you know these are like ready to go um, dev kits and stuff for for TFTs. So this is like kind of a full thing, like you know this is a full uh, TFT driver. Uh, these are OLED drivers, but what we really want, um, and these are modules, of course, they, they do have modules. If you don't want to do the work of driving a raw display, you know, you, this is what most people think of when they think of LCDs, right? And, and we stock these. These are LCDs that have the backlight and the module and the metal plate, and they bring out the pins, and it's like the HD 77 something. You're ready to go. But um, these aren't customized. These are dot matrix. So, you know, if you want to customize it, you're going to have to do your own driver. So going back, so back to PMIC um, display drivers. So, you know, what's interesting here is that these are considered PMICs. And I kind of see why. Like, they are, in a sense, sort of power management ICs, but they're also, like, kind of not. Um, so I'll say that there's a couple different kinds of products mixed into this category. So the first thing is, uh, this is something that I'm going to want to use now, so I'm going to go with active. Um, and you know, there's, there's like, you know, a dip and there's QFN and there's like kind of some ridiculous stuff here. Um, I'm going to go with non-marketplace products. So I just see like the original components and I just want, um, LCD drivers for now because LCD is quite different than OLED or LED or vacuum fluorescent. Um, and I also only want surface mount. I don't want through hole. Okay. So when I got to here, what's interesting is there was a couple different things. So there was a mix. There was like some of these like really large pin devices mixed with some of these like, this is like a, you know, a 40 um, XX logic device. So 
I'll say one thing that was interesting is there was a couple of these like really like ancient devices, but they were like, you know, this was this is like a 20 volt device. It says copyright 2003, but this was probably originally from like, you know, I don't know, the 80s or something. And these are for, you know, old LCD devices where like there was a microcomputer, but you needed something to help you drive it. Um, and this is not what we want. We want something that will actually do the scanning for us, sort of like um, seven segment LED drivers that I've got, the HT16K33s. They do the multiplexing for you, and that's what I want. This is this is not doing the multiplexing for you. This is assuming that you're gonna like do all the work. So this was a little hard to um, separate out, but what I did notice is that um, first off, there's like different configuration segments, and second, the interface. So this was considered like a BCD interface, because, like binary coded decimal, because there was a driver that was controlling it. So I want to get rid of the BCD because I don't want the I don't want that kind. I really just want like I squared C and then like SPI and serial, you know, those are fine. And then when I filtered those out, I was like, okay, you know, now now we're getting now we're getting somewhere. So these are there's like, again, there's a couple different types. There's segments and there's dot matrix. And the one I'm talking about, like the dot matrix is, of course, you know, 64 by 32 dots. But I want segments because I want like the, you know, seven segment or whatever um, design. So what I'm going to do is I also don't need like 500 segments. I was like, let's do, you know, like if I have a seven segment, let's say hex segment, right? So you have 15 um, elements per. I was like, I don't really need more than like 100 and. 48, 150 segments. So let's just limit us because there was definitely like massive, massive chips. I didn't need a massive chip. And so then they actually kind of got very reasonable and um, the prices weren't too bad either. Like you can see that they're a couple dollars. Um, and then I was like, well, I have a lot of choices here. Uh, looks like Rome has a series. TI has a couple series. Um, this is PLCC, not so interested in the PLCC. I was kind of like, I was getting a little spoilt for choice, to be honest. So what I decided to do is like, well, first up, let's look for stuff in stock. And then second, I want ones that are I squared C only. So I picked two wire serial, which is like another word for I squared C. Um, I picked serial also in case like it got categorized that way. And... Um, I sorted by price and I actually got a couple options. So um, on semi has one chip um, and a lot of these are, let's see, this is serial. Let me actually look at this one. Let's look at this one, the LC75. So a lot of these are like general purpose. They can run from three to five volts, which is wonderful. Um, let's look at the, usage okay so this one uh, you can see the segments in the comments are driven up here there's an inhibit there's an oscillator um, but this doesn't have I squared C this actually has like a kind of a three pin serial so I'm gonna skip that and then I was like oh let's check out this Rome one which I kind of like that it had there's a couple different Rome uh, boards looks like they have slightly different sizes or configurations uh, they have a 48 segment and an uh, 80 segment. So I checked out this one. Hold on. It's a, like a big data sheet. It's a chunker. Let's see, I already downloaded it. And this one was actually really nice. So first off, it comes in a, in a very cute uh, QFN, 24-pin QFN. Also can run three or five volts, which is great. They have two versions, you know, 80 segment and a 48 segment. Um, no oscillator needed, has integrated oscillator, no external components, low power consumption. And it's like, I like love this block diagram because it's like power, segment output, ground all the test pins and I squared C. And then inside is uh, DDRAM. 
So it has the RAM for you. It has like a blink generator. Um, and it kind of does all the work. It's very simple. I kind of like, I kind of like the simplicity of, of this board. And then you just, you know, you just have to figure out in your software, you map, you know, you tell it the, um, you write to the RAM and they're like, this is the DD RAM. So you have internal RAM that's refreshed for you. You tell it which segments you want on and off by writing to the RAM over I squared C and it does everything else. It does all that multiplexing, the AC waveforms, um, beautifully. So this is actually an adorable little chip. I kind of like it. And it looks like there's a couple different modes. Um, you know, if you have a chip that has built in LCD driving, great, but it could be that you don't. It could be you're like, oh, I'm stuck with this Freescale chip or this NXP or chip or this AVR. It doesn't have built in LCD driver. Um, so this would be a really good alternative. So this was my pick for the great search because it's in stock, it's inexpensive, it's I squared C, it's a QFN, it's really simple, doesn't need any external components, um, and looks like it's a very easy chip to use and integrate if you'd like to add LCD interface. So check out the Rome BU97 series of uh, LCD drivers. I think I might make a STEM IQT board out of this. That can be really handy if you get LCDs and you're like, I wanna quickly start it up, uh, having a breakout would be cool. That's a great search. Where in the world is that part I need? The great search with DJ King. All right. Uh, I'm going to do a couple quick questions. Yeah. Uh, can the pipe portal be programmed with the Arduino ID? The answer is it can. Yes. Next up. Uh, where'd you get the little tiny 4x1 LCDs you were working on last time? Four by one. I don't have any four by one. These are three by one, and I got these on AliExpress, but I don't have the link on me. Okay. But they're just like. Uh, would you consider making a feather with an RP twenty forty and a Lura module? Um, I would, but I'm not. Um, I've got just got a huge pile of redesigns I got to take care of okay. first. I can answer this one. It'd be cool if the search on Adafruit.com had sil uh, filters for active and in stock like Digikey does. Yeah. We what? have disc. We have a discontinued. We have that. Um, no, well, we have in stock. There is a filter on the right for in stock and yeah. for discontinued. By default, you're not going to see discontinued, and by default, you'll see stuff whether or not it's in stock. But you can select yeah. a thing to say only in stock. You can see that. And things go very fast in and out of stock now because that's the way the world is. And the last one is, any insights on what causes the ghosting? That was for the... I think it's just... Um, I think that the ghosting is caused by not um, pulling the charge off of the LCD plate um, in time and the one of the things that's a little annoying is it's like nobody else has done this so there's like no analysis and so I kind of got this demo running in like an hour or two and then I was like immediately like squirrel move on to the next thing yeah. you know got it working I, I don't really care for it so I just I was like somebody else can look at why the ghosting happens I don't you know there's no information and and I kind of know why it happens but like I messed with like the turn on off times a couple times, you know, a couple things. I couldn't really make it go away, and I was like, ah, you know. Okay. It's probably some detail. Do you have a good alternative for J Link? I need to program the bootloader on a SAMD21. Uh, you could use the AVR ICE for that. I believe they're still in stock. Atmel's been pretty good about keeping their tool chain stuff in stock, but it's a shame because the J Links are quite nice. Okay. And that's it. We'll see everybody during the week. Normal week shows. We'll thank give you. everyone any updates and more. And thank you so much for joining us. This Ooh, 30 minutes on the dot. Sunday, and uh, I want to do a hug report and shout out to Foamy Guy Tim, who did an amazing, excellent job getting us all started on going back to the future with, with Winamp. Winamp. It is a cool thing to see a physical Winamp player on a screen. It is funny. Just, it is super neat. You look over at it, and it's just like, that's comforting. We all it's need nice. a little, and we all need a little bit of comforting. All right, that's it. Everybody. All right, thanks everybody. Bye.